right. So anyhow, uh, this morning I want to continue our series out of 1 John. And I'll be looking at 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 12. I'm going to title this morning's message, True Love is God's Love. So 1 John 4, 7 through 12, um, reading from the New American Standard. It says, Beloved, let us love one another. For love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. And the one who does not know God, uh, and the one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. By this, the love of God has, was manifested in us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. Father, thank you for this word. I pray that it would go forth in the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. That, Lord, you would bless this word and just uh, use it for your purpose this morning and, and online uh, later today in the lives of each and every one who hears. Let us receive it with glad and joyful hearts. And I pray, Lord, that it would speak to us, that you would speak to us, Lord, as only you can in love. Bless the word in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So I was doing a little, just um, out of the um, side note here, I was doing a little research this week, and I realized that next Saturday is the 38th anniversary of new creation. And I think it's what's interesting is we had a celebration on the 35th, and three years does not seem like that long, does it? No. So maybe, maybe by the 40th we will have gotten rid of these, <laughs> right? And who knows? Maybe we can get together again and celebrate the 40th anniversary. I'm just praying, Lord, keep us here, sustain us. You know, it's on the smaller churches. It's really getting difficult. Uh, you know. The longer this goes on, the more difficult it's been. I've read some articles recently about that. And so we're just praying, Lord, you know, be with us, sustain us. Um, I've got two termite inspectors coming in this week. We might have termites. I don't know, but we're going to find out this week. And if we do, get some quotes. So uh, pray that uh, we get a good report or something. I think we're going to have some issues, but we'll see what happens. So uh, Lord, be with us because those are not inexpensive uh, remedy. But going on this morning with the message, uh, true love is God's love. Love for one's brother comes from God. And I think if there's anything that this world needs right now, it's love. And I don't mean what the world needs now is love, sweet love. Okay? Uh, granted, you know, we have to go back a few years for that one, and some of you remember that. I remember that uh, when it came out. Uh, but what we need is not just love, sweet love. We need the love of God. I mean, there just seems to be today this tension that's growing in our culture. This, uh, for lack of a better term, I think it's just a hatred for one another. You know, and it just seems to be, we, we watched the news this morning, and, and there's just so much that's going on in the world. And, uh, you know, the lack of respect for the love of another person, uh, for life itself, is, is just becoming... Um, uh, a common occurrence daily and individuals are have this they, they feel the freedom to go out there and to even publicly announce or proclaim or YouTube video how they feel about something and or Facebook it and, and even threaten life publicly and yet we want to get along we want to be a part of something bigger than ourselves and we try to find it within ourselves and it's impossible because we cannot find it without God. As John said in verse 7, which is that, that one of those classical, uh, I'm going to say 1980s hymns uh, we used to sing in church, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, right? And everyone that loves is born of God and knows God, for God is love. First John 4, 7, 8, remember that? Got to go back a ways. Okay, it was in our church where we used to go back in Ohio. But notice what he says, let us love one another, why? For love is from God. And if you don't know God, you can't truly love. And there's some, out, some of you are going to hear this, some of you out there in uh, maybe internet land are going to hear this, you're going to say, well, that's 
that's, that's a bunch of malarkey. But I'll tell you what, it's not, because love is unconditional. And what I find with human love is it is conditional love. Okay, so if we're going to have true love, we cannot have it within ourselves because there's always conditions that are applied to that. It must come from God. You see, it is evidence of our being born of God. And that is an import, as important as righteous behavior. You know, if we're going to be righteous and we're going to live as a righteous individual, then we must live with love and in love, in God's love. Love is not a virtue. It's not this innate uh, sense that exists in us, nor is it a learned behavior. Okay? We were watching just something um, recently. I can't remember what it was. And it reminded me uh, or uh, of just how... Um, as parents, sometimes we try to get our children to love one another during difficult times. You know, like what I mean by that? Those knockdown drag outs your kids have, right? Okay, and so, and, and you tell me, you have to love your brother, you have to love your sister. And, and we say, yeah, we know that, but deep down inside, do we really? I mean, we do, but at that moment, do we really? You know, and, and there's this sense here that, that it, it is a learned behavior that we learn to love. Now, I think when it comes to food, we learn to love, right? Certain things. We had a conversation, Kevin had a conversation this week about some things. We were, I think we were on one of our walks. And I, I, the whole idea of Brussels sprouts, I still haven't learned to love Brussels sprouts yet. But our son came over, our youngest came over Monday to help us with do some things around the house. And, and like I said last Sunday, we had five guys. You don't have to learn to love cheeseburgers. That's just a given, right? Mm -hmm. Brussels sprouts, you don't learn. Yeah. All right? It's learned behavior. But love for a person is not learned behavior. Love for another individual is not. Because why? Because we're all created in the very image of God himself. And to love, to not love someone is to not love God. So it is important we understand this. Whoever truly loves his brother not only is born of God, but also knows God. And, and that comes from Glenn Barker, uh, from the Expositor's uh, Bible Commentary. The idea, how can we say we love someone and not love God? And how can we say that we love God and not love someone else? John's words to the people fill our hearts and our minds with the importance of true Christ-centered love. If we choose not to love, then we choose not to truly know God. And again, I'm, I'm, you may feel I'm belaboring the issue here, but this is very important for us because this deals with our relationship with Jesus Christ. It deals with our relationship with our Heavenly Father. It deals with our relationship with the Holy Spirit. How can I be hateful, have hatefulness in my heart and my soul, and expect the, uh, the spirit of love to reside in me in its fullness? It can't. And it's not because the Spirit chooses not to reside in me, but because I choose to neglect to let the Spirit reside in me. I'm the one that's fighting against it as the individual. If we choose not to love, then we choose not to know God. The difference lies not in knowing of Him. And that's, I think, the most important thing. There are a lot of hating people out there today who know God, who have God in their, their, their minds and their hearts. They know of him, but they do not know him. They do not have that relationship. Our knowledge of God leads us beyond our love for God to include a love for all. When we, when we get to know him, to know who he is and what it's all about, the, the, the songs we sing each and every week about the love of Jesus Christ, the love of God, knowing God, wanting God into our hearts and our lives. To have that is to say that I want more than just a, a head knowledge I want, of who he is or, or, or of him. I want a knowledge that says he is my God. You see, love flows out of God because God is its source. I've shared on love in the past, and as I've shared before, you know, for us, love is a shared attribute of God. We, we love because God loves. The difference is, is that we, we love conditionally, but God loves unconditionally. We love as a verb. 
Okay? It's an action. It's something that we do. God loves because it's who he is. God cannot exist and not be loved. It's just a, it's an attribute of who he is. It's not a characteristic of God. It's his very, very nature. And so as, as that, for that reason, God becomes the very source. How do we know the love? Because of God. Love would be born to us about God. Because God is love. Not God does love action, but is love. It's who he is. So then what does this mean for us as believers? If we understand this and we look at God as our source, Jesus Christ is our example, then what does this mean for us? How, do, how does the world know what true love is? We become the embodiment of that love. We, if we are truly brothers and sisters in Christ, and if we truly are born of Jesus Christ and, and a child of God, then we become the world's example of love. That unconditional, uns, unworthy, unswerving, whatever, love of God. And so there are three things I want us to look at that might help us to uh, help the world, really. Because these are things that we should know about, uh, that they should know about our, us, that we should know about ourselves. And the first of these is we are known by our love. John 13, 35 says, By this everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Now, I think this is a very interesting passage because uh, when you think about it, Jesus is talking directly to his disciples. I'm going to be gone here in a little while. You're going to be left. How will the world know that you are my disciples? Is it by the way you preach? Is it by the words that you share? Is it by the, um, you know... The, the sense of community that you have and the bond that you have with one another. While all those things are important, none of them are significant without love. And I've been in the church a long time, as many of us have, and it, it's interesting to find out that, or to see that within the church there can be this lack of love amongst the disciples. And then the world looks at the church and says, well, if that's what being a Christian is all about, why would I want anything to do with it? And as Jesus says, they'll know you as my disciples by your love. Not by your teaching, not by your doctrine, not by your, the size of your building or the size of your congregation, but by the actions that speak louder than words, your love for one another. You see, the most important command that Jesus left his disciples was to love one another. I mean, there are things that, you know, we see the Great Commission and things that Jesus called them to do and said that these are the things that you do. But if you are not going to love one another, what's the point? Our actions should be motivated and grounded in love. Jesus knew that the spirit of rivalry would disrupt their fellowship before they could accomplish his commission to them. We were just on Wednesday night, we were in uh, Philippians, and we were talking about the internal struggle of the church with Euodia and Syntyche and, and what took place there and, and the how it was beginning to kind of split the church. And it's interesting that Paul mentions these two ladies in a very positive light as fellow workers in the gospel. Let's mend this because they were both a benefit to me. They were fellow workers and yet somewhere along the line division takes place. And as we shared about it, I said, well, Paul doesn't give us the details, but this can come in any form in the church today. Anywhere where, where there's a lack of love and there's a splitting of individuals, trouble sets in. And so this was going to take place. I think this is why Jesus gave this. Jesus understood that we are not perfect. And so we have to go beyond uh, ourselves to love one another. The attitude of love would be the bond that would keep them united and would be the convincing that... Ooh, thank you, Greg. I never got a standing ovation before. Uh, anyway, um, the attitude of love would be the bond that would keep them united and would be the convincing demonstration that they partake of his own spirit and purpose. If Jesus shows us anything, it shows us he embodied love. 
If the cross shows us and indicates anything to us, the cross indicates the love of God, the love of Christ, and how far he was willing to take that love. The command to love one another has almost no meaning apart from the contextual preposition, as I have loved you. Jesus Christ is our example. It's what who we, it, if we are going to live as Christ has called us to live, then we must live as Christ lived. We cannot live apart from that example. Love one another as I have loved you. You see, the, the same commandment that is applied to the disciples is applied to every believer and is rooted only in the love of Christ. It's not rooted in our love for one another apart from Christ. I mean, there are times in our lives that we feel like, you know, I, we feel that someone we can come into contact with is unlovable. There are times in our lives where we, our actions prove us to be unlovable. And yet at the same time, Christ said, love anyway. You know, when Jesus looked down from the cross, I did not believe that he saw a bunch of people that just were expressing a great love for them. He saw the, the religious leaders who he died for. He saw the, the, the Roman uh, centurion and others who he died for. He saw those that were weeping at the cross who he died for. He didn't just look at the weeping who were, who were losing something and say, I'm dying for you. He's saying, I'm dying for you. For you, those who crucified me and for, or for those who drug me away and for those who beat me and for those who cry for me. He died for all of them. And that's the example he sets for each and every one. As I have loved you, so you must love. The second thing we see is we maintain fellowship through our love. 1 Peter 4.8 says, Above all, love each other deeply, because love covers a multitude of sins. Now, that quote is from Proverbs. He quotes Proverbs 10.12 here. And reminds his readers of the primacy of forgiveness. Okay? Love covers a multitude of sins. And, and you know what? This is an interesting passage, and it's one that I think can be misinterpreted. Because what it means is, okay, I, I don't have to love, or I have to kind of force this love out because of sins. It does not mean that love covers or atones for our sins. What it means is that love does not stir up sin. If I'm loving, sin cannot be a part of that. It's not a matter of waiting for someone to sin and then say, okay, now I love you. Love covers a multitude of sin. The idea here is that it does not stir up or broadcast them. So the major idea is that love suffers in silence and bears all things. I thought that was interesting. I, I, again, I pulled that out of a commentary, so that's a... Uh, Edwin Bloom brought this up, up in his commentary to the Hebrews uh, in pastoral epistles. The idea, in the proverb, the meaning is that love does not stir up sin or broadcast them. So the major idea is that love suffers in silence and bears all things. And as I read that and was thinking about that, I thought to myself, okay, in my years in the body of Christ, have I ever seen someone who was, who felt mistreated, felt sinned against by another believer, who walked around publicizing that sin and finishing it off by saying, but I love him. Because love covers a multitude of sins. That's hypocrisy. If you love him, you wouldn't have broadcast it to begin with. You'd have walked away and prayed. It's ridiculous to think that I have to throw all this out and dump my garbage in somebody else's lap and then about someone, but then close it out with this, this pious statement of how much I love them. Well, if you really love them, you wouldn't be saying what you're saying regardless. You'd be working towards restoration, not condemnation. I think this is important for us to understand. You see, the believer forgives faults in others because they know that for the forgiving grace of God that's in their own lives. You know, I think again, the scripture is a great example for us of how God doesn't just forgive our sins, he forgets them. The concept there. We have sinned against God, and once he has wiped that slate clean, it's no more because of love. 
So when someone sins against us, we wipe that slate clean and it's no more. It doesn't get brought up again. It doesn't become something that influences us the next time we're in contact with that individual. Love suffers in silence. As Bloom said, I just love that statement. Love suffers in silence and bears all things. Not just some, all. And this brings us to our third point here, and that is we serve in love. 1 Thessalonians 2.8, so we cared for you because we loved you so much. We were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. See, the missionaries, Paul and his traveling companions, their willingness to go beyond the God-given task of sharing the gospel demonstrated the strength and genuineness of the love they had for the Thessalonians. If Paul shows us anything in his journeys, is that Paul understood the concept of godly love. He went into towns. He, he was kicked out of synagogues. He was, he, he was chastised and beaten. He was, he was lied about and spat upon and, and shipwrecked. And, all of, and yet in all of this, all we see is the expression of God's love. You see, we loved you so much. That statement that he makes here represents a rare word of a certain uh, uh, found beginnings. And I'm not going to give you the Greek word here. It's a long one. But the idea here, the general thrust is clear, though. The missionaries knew that a constant yearning for these people so much that they found it a continual delight. If we could learn to express our desire for relationship with others, a godly relationship with others, then how can we have anything but godly foundation in love? We don't seek relationships with people we don't want to, uh, we don't like. You know, I don't like that person. I think I'm going to get to know them better, and I want them to become part of my life. That's the human way of saying, no, I'm not going to, no, no, I'm not going to do that because I was using, you know, being ridiculous there. I don't like them. I want nothing to do with them. Okay, but you know, I love them as a as a human being. What a ridiculous statement. Okay, if you really love them, then you want something. We don't separate ourselves from them. But the idea here is to share their whole being with them, without exception. When Paul traveled into Thessalonica, he had no idea who he was going to meet, what was going to happen, as with Corinth, Philippi, Galatia, anywhere that he went. He didn't go looking to meet someone whom he loved. He went looking to make relationships and learn to love new people to make new brothers and sisters in the Lord, to, to, to have new relationships in Christ. You see, the believer's love is so grounded in Christ and his nature that he or she yearns for the opportunity to express Christ's love to those who need him. And who are those who need him? Everybody. There are no exceptions to be drawn here. We can't decide who is worthy and not worthy because Christ died for all. And if he died for all, then all are worthy. Are we going to run into individuals who rub us the wrong way? Absolutely. Are we going to run into individuals who mistreat us, say things about us that shouldn't be said? Speak poorly of us, whatever? Absolutely. So what's our response? Well, if our true love, if it's God's love, is to love them back. You know, there's that passage about loving someone who doesn't like you and then heaping burning coals on your head. And wow, that's an interesting passage of scripture. Okay? If that's your motivation, you're not loving. I'm going to love them so God can show them when they're wrong. Oh my goodness gracious. Is that really love? No, it's not love. It's selfishly motivated. There is nothing selfishly motivated about what Jesus Christ did. Except for the fact, 
I guess if there was any selfish motivation, it was to restore that which was broken. If he had any selfish motivation whatsoever, it was to bring us back into a right relationship with the Father. He missed us. Two things derived from John's understanding of love. First, love for God, as it was expressed by false teachers, becomes primarily an exercise in self-gratification, and as such, it expresses the vanity of those teachers. Again, when we talked about 1 John, and I said we'll go through 1st, 2nd, 3rd John because they all tie together, there are those false teachers that you've mentioned, okay? And you know, false teachers presented false love as a means of getting self-gratification. And John says this doesn't work. It's not from God, it's from them, and they're luring you away from the truth. The second thing, one can never attribute love to God and say, for example, that God loves us. As an absolute, God is always passionless and unmoved. Now what does that mean? If we see love as something that's passionate, human love, right? Something that is moved by feelings and emotions. Okay, then that would say that God loves when he feels like loving. God loves when he feels passionate about loving. Okay, those are the action loves that we do. But if God's love is nothing more than an attribute of who he is, it's how he exists. It's like those, those attributes. God is love. Okay? God is truth. Um, those that are right up there with omniscience, all knowing, all powerful, all present, all love. We cannot exist apart from it. So he's not moved by love. He is love. He cannot decide today, I'm going to do something in your life that is not grounded in love. Every action he performs in our life is in love. Now, there are things that we might think, God, what are you doing in this? Don't you love me? And his response is, of course I love. That's why I'm doing it the way I'm doing it. Can we accept that? When we consider these, this idea of being known by our love, the idea of being uh, maintaining fellowship through our love. And not, what I mean by fellowship, I don't just mean the church body. Fellowship is with all believers. If we could fellowship through love, the love of God, if we could sit across the table <laughs> in a non-pandemic situation or whatever, but if we could have a relationship to talk to someone who is so different than us, who thinks different than we do, uh, if we could do those types of things and, and do it in the love of God, the world would be a lot better place. Here's something about love that I think is very interesting. You can't legislate it. There's no bill that Congress can pass that will require us to love another person. But God is love. Only through him is it possible. And then, of course, if we can maintain that fellowship, we learn to work and serve together in love. So as we close this morning and close our times together, our time together here and as online when you see this later today, as we close our time, my question to you is, do you love one another as God loves? That's the only re prerequisite, the only requirement I have, that's the only challenge I have for us today, is to love as God loves. And everyone who loves, as God loves, must be born of God, without an exception. Let's bow our heads. Father, this morning, as we close our time together, I thank you, Lord, that we can uh, read these words from your servant, John. That, Lord, he talks about the love of God over and above any human-type love, any type of passion or any type of emotional expression. These are the things the world has. And as we love in passion, we also hate with passion. But if we love in God, there can be no hate. And so, Lord, I ask that you would speak to each and every one of us, those of us here this morning, those online, 
that you would stir our hearts for the love of God, for the greater love that is that surpasses anything in the world. Help us to seek this out. Help us to live it each and every day. Help us to love. Let that be our challenge for the week, to love as God loved. Without exception, help us to put away the human frailties for the greater love. We thank you, Lord, for our time together today. Bless it. Bless each and every one who is here this morning. Keep us safe and healthy. And Lord, I pray that you would be with those also online. Keep them safe. And we just pray again, Lord, as we do every week for an end to this whole pandemic situation. By your hand, Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 God bless you. I want to thank you all for coming this morning. As always, if you have a gift or an offering to the church, there's a basket up here. You can also give online at, uh, at the church website, or there's a text to give feature that we have available that you can also give. And God bless you. May the Lord be with you. And we, I thank you that, you that you're with us. In Jesus' name.